Hello, everyone. I'm Deep Mehdi. I'm one of the organizers of SKC Science and Technology at webinar series. And today we have uh, uh, Sarfraz Tahir as the webinar speaker. He's going to talk about uh, medical device and heart diseases. I know Sarfraz, who goes, his nickname is Reza, for many, many years, as long as I can remember. Uh, we both uh, grew up in Guwahati in the same neighborhood. And uh, he's doing some amazing stuff and I wanted to hear. And um, what happened about a year ago, I was visiting him in Minnesota. I, actually, I was at a conference in Minnesota and then uh, he said that, oh, do you want to go see our uh, facilities? I said, uh, sure. Uh, we spent about an hour. He took me around what they do, how they build the medical devices. And I thought it was so fascinating what he works on. Uh, his, uh, background is uh, actually electrical electronics engineering he did from NIT Kurukshetra and then he has an MBA from uh, Carnegie Mellon University after that uh, he worked on many places and currently serves as the director of clinical trial for electrophysiology at Boston Scientific so with that I'm going to hand it off to uh, Sarfraz take it away Sarfraz uh, good evening and good morning uh, Devuda, thanks for you know having me share a few of my thoughts today. Um, I have uh, named this presentation uh, "Medical Devices and Heart Diseases." Uh, I could have easily done that. This as heart device, heart diseases, and medical devices. The reason I say heart medical devices is because I'm going to focus on medical device and medical device industry. Um, this uh, presentation is focused towards those who have ve had very little exposure to the medical device industry. Uh, however, you cannot talk about medical devices without talking about heart diseases. So I will give you a very high level overview um, of what the diseases are. Um, and then we'll spend most of our time uh, talking about medical devices. Um, so, uh, I think the question and answers will be more towards the end and Devuda as a moderator I will ask some questions along the way. That's uh, correct. So I'll ask you for a clarification. Uh, yes. you know, so I will do as a somebody not knowing much about it, obviously. So, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So what I wanted to cover today, today's goal, like I said, is more, I know the the audience um, is all the way from those who are, well, you know, who are in the college to some who are in the universities to some who are interested in the topic and maybe some MDs uh, also. Uh, however, this is geared towards, like I said, um, those uh, folks who have very little exposure to this industry. And there's a lot to talk about. Um, what I'm going to focus on today is uh, just to put the you know a baseline about what the common heart diseases are, and then quickly transition to the medical devices. And there's a lot to talk about there. That's where we're going to spend a, the most of our time here. And then who are, those who are looking, let's say, for uh, careers in the medical device industry, um, they will have a chance to see what engineering of medical devices are about, and what are the different roles that are a part of um, this industry. Um, and then one big part of the regulated industry is getting approvals. And that's a fascinating area. Uh, and I'll cover you know, some of that towards the end of my presentation here. That's also interesting because we are hearing a lot about that uh, with the COVID you know, vaccines right now, right? So how the regulations uh, works out in terms of approval process. So that also has some relation, you know, people can relate to because of that. So that's yes, I'll, interest. Yeah. I'll try to tie that into my conversation here today. Fantastic. We're Very almost good. about to get approval for a couple of viruses and there's some terminologies that you may hear on the, um, you know, uh, uh, on TV. And I'll try to weave that into the conversation today. Great. All right. So heart diseases. Um, think about the heart as a four-chamber room with plumbing and electricals. Okay. So the issues with the heart come with 
issues with the plumbing. That means some of the arteries and veins in the heart that is supplying blood to the heart tissue, heart muscle or heart tissue, um, they may not work well. Or the electrical, some electrical wires may be broken uh, where the propagation of electricity is not good. Or some walls, some structures, um, they're not good. So these are kind of the three basic areas through which the heart has got problems. So one of the key or the big diseases is what is called the coronary artery disease. The name coronary artery comes from coronary is pertaining to the heart, but there is a major artery in the heart that supplies um, blood uh, to the heart muscle. And then there are very, uh, a, a, a large number of other arteries that, that and um, emerge from that. And one of the issues um, that has been, that has plagued the, you know, the modern world is the clogging of these arteries. So, tip, so when, when clogging happens, then the blood supply to the heart tissue is stopped. And then what, that is when we have something called a heart attack. So there's a, there's an issue or there's a plug, uh, there's a plaque uh, formation here. And then the blood does not just go to this part of the tissue. And given that there's no oxygen, no blood going to that part of the tissue, the tissue dies. So we hear a lot about heart attack. So that's what heart attack is. Heart attack is essentially a manifestation of um, the plumbing issue, okay? Uh, there's a block in the, in one of the veins. Uh, and coronary artery is one of the major arteries that supplies and that's where the, that terminology comes from. Uh, and the, when it dies, it actually dies, it becomes like a scar, okay? When, when there's a cut and uh, once the cut heals, there's a thick tissue, right? The thick tissue is different from the normal tissue and that's what it looks like. So there are lots of uh, different variations of that disease, there could be partial blockage, there could be mul uh, uh, full blockage, there could be blockage in multiple um, you know, branches, which is where we talk about um, you know, bypass surgeries and multiple bypass surgeries uh, or stents, and I'll talk about that. So that's what heart attack uh, or coronary heart, and this is one of the leading causes of death. Second is structural heart issues. Uh, which I talked about, let's say some of the walls are not done well or some, there's some weakness. They come in kind of three forms. Um, there are the, uh, I'm assuming there's you know, reasonable understanding on what the heart looks like. There are four chambers, there are walls. Um, the top chambers are called the atria or atrium and the bottom chambers are called ventricle. This is a wall that typically should separate the left a ventricle with the right ventricle. However, there might be some structural defects. These can be right from birth um, and, and which kind of grow over time. Uh, so that, that is a defect in that septal wall. This is, a, this is what is called a septum. There might be other issues of where the valves are leaking. The valves are supposed to allow blood to go from one chamber to the other. If the valves are leaking because they're not closing properly or they are not, uh, 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 or there are some um, in the malfunction that is going on, uh, then these valves may have issues. Or the vessels that take blood in and out, they are not properly formed or they are not um, you know, in the right shape. They may have some constriction, they may have some uh, tissue growth those are defect, uh, so defects, uh, defects, defects in the vessels. Reza, so those are quick, quick question yeah. here. Uh, as a percent of the population, what percentage have uh, structural de have heart defects like the ones you just talked about? If you don't know, that's fine. You know, just yeah, so, um, it is actually in in a, if it, I don't know exact number and. It's a little bit of a different, uh, difficult question because there are congenital heart issues, which is That's correct. by birth. Mm -hmm. And then there are issues when there is something called stenosis that happens on these 
Uh, and that's different. So I can provide some of that information later on. Okay, that's a good. great question. Great. Uh, and I'm, I'm just to keep it simple. I put everything under structural hard. And you, when you look into this industry, you'll see, you know, the big companies like Abbott, Boston Scientific, Medtronic. They'll have a structural hard division, and they put all of these things together. Um, one reason of kind of putting it this way is. Um, this is how these industry is also organized. I see, okay, mm -hmm. good. Uh, then a big part of um, uh, the heart diseases are on the electrical side of things, okay? So we talked a little bit about the plumbing side, the, you know, the pipes uh, that deliver blood. Then there are electrical uh, issues with the heart where the heart is supposed to, um, you know, uh, a, a, a compress in a certain way in order to pump blood. Um, so there are typically, you know, three, and this is this is a vast field. So it's a typical, you know, to almost oversimplify things, um, the rhythm can be either fast, very fast. So what is normal? Normal heartbeat is about 60 to 70 beats per minute. When it's fast, which is called tachycardia, the beat, beats are really high, which is 130, 140, 200 beats per minute. So when, when something like that happens, people feel like a lot of thumping in their heart and the heart is racing. Those are the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, th that's how they explain, okay? The heart feels like there's a lot of, um, my chest is pumping. Um, then there's what is called bradycardia. Um, bradycardia is actually slowness of the heart. So the heart rate falls uh, to, you know, 25, 30 beats per minute. And, um, you know, typically happens um, to um, older people uh, and they complain about not having uh, energy and uh, they pass out every so often, which is called syncope. Uh, so in, in tachycardia also, you can do that. But in bradycardia, it's much more common to have syncope and the heart rates are really slow. Then there are irregular heartbeats. There's no you know, pattern. It could arise at any chamber of the heart and that gets really complex. So um, let me kind that of- That could be congenital also, right? So the- Yeah, that could be congenital also. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's an electrical side of the uh, issue. Of now. course, so, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'll show a small, uh, let's see if I can get the video up here. Uh, it's coming up, give me a second. So, are, I'm, are you able to see my video? Yep, mm -hmm. very good. Okay. So on the normal side of the heart, mm -hmm. there is what is called the heart has got its own pacemaker. It's the SA node. Mm -hmm. It fires, the signals go down. You can see these. Um, and, and so the atrium contracts, then the ventricle contracts, then the, so it starts with the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And that's how it is supposed to be. However, in an irregular heartbeat, um, well, let me stay with the normal heart. So normal heart, what happens? You can see there's a pattern, the top chamber and the bottom chamber and then the top chamber on the left and the bottom chamber, you know, that, that's the rhythm um, that, that happens. So it squishes from the top, the blood goes to the ventricle, the ventricle squishes and the blood goes out. On the atrial fibrillation, or that this is a, a picturization or, or video of the atrial fibrillation where there's no regularity in how it's pumping. Consequently, what happens is blood doesn't flow properly. And blood, some of the blood stays in the ventricle. And before all of blood can go off, <laughs> there's a, some blood comes from the atrium again. And so there's blood kind of churning in here and nothing much is happening. Okay. Nice video, very good. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so, um, and, and there's a series of devices to handle that. Uh, so that's electrical. Now, on there's what what happens is when the blood actually sits in the heart, um, it starts to if it's not flowing, it tends to coagulate, it tends to clot, 
and one of those pieces of um, uh, you know a, a clot clotted blood can go to the brain and block a particular artery in the um, in the brain where the then the blood does not reach to the uh, blood the blood oxygen does not reach to certain parts of the brain and that piece of the brain dies and that's what is called a stroke so uh, when a piece of brain dies a part of your body actually stops working which is why with stroke you see paralysis right mm -hmm. um, so commonly we hear about hey uh, there's the stroke heart attack heart attack is more of a plumbing side uh, on uh, stroke it's because of manifestation of um, electrical on, in this particular context, uh, context but there could be some stenosis or blockage of uh, these um, arteries also for other reasons uh, where which can lead to stroke uh, but um, issues with arrhythmia uh, is that when when there is malfunctioning of these rhythms it can lead to you know uh, clots and these clots can dislodge and go uh, to the brain and then cause stroke um, one other manifestation of um, heart issues uh, is that the heart enlarges. The heart enlarges um, and the normal size of the heart is this, typically the size of a fist. And the enlarged heart can go almost up to two times that size. And then, so what's actually going on is since the blood is not able to pump properly, the blood stays and the muscle starts becoming bigger and bigger, right? And when it's not, uh, and it manifests in different ways. One is the chambers actually become big, uh, which is called dilation, which is, dilation means expansion, um, dilated cardiomyopathy, or the, because of the functions uh, or some part of the tissue, um, you know, is, is already dead, the walls of the heart become thick. And that's why it does not pump properly, which is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so okay. this is mostly in the heart heart failure side of things. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? No, no, it's fine. They're great. Oh, oh, so what I'm kind of understanding that uh, I kind of like that you're giving an engineering sort of way to look at it. You talk about the mechanical, which is plumbing and the electrical, but uh, the way the electrical issues come up seems to be a chemical reaction really over, over a lifetime potentially. Is that correct? That's correct. So now we're going to get into cellular stuff, which I okay. don't want to spend a whole lot of time on. What happens is there are tissues. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a sinus node here, mm -hmm. and through the tissue, through the heart tissues, the signal is supposed to go down this way through the walls, right? Now, if the tissue is, and the tissue cells are not oriented in the right way, the signal may stay right here, okay? okay. And that's where the chemical balance of the, uh, of the, the chemical imbalance actually leads to that. Uh, so the, in order to address those chemical imbalance, there are different drugs that are in play. Uh, some of you may have heard, we try to balance the sodium side of things and potassium side of things, right? So there are different drugs which are trying to, you know, address those different chemical imbalances in the heart. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because Chemical balance of the heart is absolutely important, uh, which we can do all very well with hydration. Um, so, you know, having a well hydrated body is extremely important because that lends to good chemical balance. And in when there is dehydration, when there is low hydration, uh, you know, it can lead to a whole lot of other issues. So that's in a sense kind of a high level view, very high level view of what the uh, common heart diseases are. Um, I'm almost oversimplifying it, but uh, it hopefully gives you kind of an overall picture without going too much, too much into the detail. Now let's talk about what are the different design, uh, uh, devices to treat these diseases. Now I'll go through kind of the four different um, types of diseases and then talk about them. So let's talk about coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease has got a number of products so when there's when a, when an artery is uh, pl uh, plugged, what all you can do? You can actually um, 
open that artery so that you know there's more estate, real estate, or more space for blood to flow. So you have got something called dilation catheters. You can cut the plaque, and those are there are cutting catheters. Uh, there are um, veins which are totally occluded. Occluded means totally plugged, and so you one can have. Uh, so there are some devices to clean up those occlusions. There are balloon catheters. You go and inflate the balloon inside the heart, uh, and you know you can open up open up the vessel. Guide wires are a pretty cool technology because what you have to do is actually get to the location. And how you get to the location is you make a small incision near your groin. So uh, the reason you do an incision near the groin because there's a major artery called femoral artery. Uh, and through that artery, you can actually you know, put in uh, a, a what is called a catheter. And the catheter can go from your you know, leg hip area, the groin area, all the way up to your heart. And then you can get to the different parts of the heart that way. Um, the reason that, uh, so that, that is one way to do it. The other way is to open up your heart, right? You cut it, open it, and um, stop the heart for a little bit, <laughs> operate on it, you know, restart the heart, close it. And so that's a major surgery. That's called the open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. However, in order to do these kind of things, these days, these devices have allowed uh, you to actually have these procedures and be out of the hospital within a day. Um, and all you have, all you have, is a small cut in your groin, mm -hmm. which they will either stretch up or put a tape on it, and you're good to go after a few hours. Uh, the cost is very low. The um, effective nature, the damage to the body, is uh, you know, it is very small. Um, um, cut so the, the uh, you know there's there's tremendous amount of benefits. So what I also want to point out at this point uh, time is in the world of medical devices there's something called single use devices. These are all single use devices. Um, the 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 terminology of single use devices are treated very differently by the regulatory agencies than chronic and implantable devices, which is where I'll go next. Mm -hmm. I have one question here, Reza, which is that uh, these type of devices uh, obviously also have changed over time, right? Although it is single-use devices. Um, what, uh, unless you are going to talk about it later, what sort of things are newer that you need to address as you know more about what has worked before or not? Yes, so it's all about... Um, trying to minimize trauma and trying to minimize time. Uh, so to be able to access effectively um, is where uh, all the innovation is going on. To access the I different see. parts of the heart effectively is where a lot of innovation. Uh, a, a MD's time, uh, you know, physician's time, and the lab time, and the, um, you know, all the nursing staff that goes with it, uh, if you can minimize that, that's where, you know, there's a lot of money um, to be made because the health, you can give the care to a lot more people, right? So um, accessing them and, uh, and the other part is minimizing kind of what is called adverse events. Um, meaning if you're trying to do something, well, as you are doing it, don't create a secondary issue, um, right? And secondary issue could be, as you are introducing some foreign body, there's clotting going on, and that clot might dislodge and then go to the um, brain, and uh, you know you might have a have stroke, right? So adverse events are and minimize adverse events is very important. So what is the material uh, of the different products um, and making them sort of radio opaque to see exactly where they are um, and to be able to manipulate. Uh, you know, uh, the tip in the right way uh, at the right location uh, is extremely important. So, so this, imagine it's like a long noodle, like long, right, right. thick mm -hmm. rope, mm -hmm. long, thick rope. You're trying to modify on one side so that the other end actually changes. So there's a lot of technology that's involved to make sure that you can actually make small changes or make small twist on one end so that the other end changes. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
Um, there, it looks simple here, but there's a number of parts that go in that have got high precision in order to be able to assemble it into a particular, a small uh, catheter. And catheters are measure, measured in terms of the unit called French. These are, these can be three French uh, all the way up to 12, 13, you know, and the uh, unit French comes from, um, it's a very old terminology. It comes from the size of the veins. So based on the size of the vein, uh, you're looking at, uh, you know, different, um, different sizes of these catheters and for different locations of the body, you make different sizes of uh, uh, these catheters. So uh, to be able to pack all of that technology into something really small uh, that, uh, and, and when I'm talking about this, uh, imagine you know, all your torso and all that, you know, tortuosity in your, in, in your veins. Um, um, and it, this, these are 90 centimeters, um, 105 centimeter long catheters. So, and to have a technology where you can actually manipulate one end by, you know, touching on the other or uh, change, you know, manipulating with, with the handle on the other end is kind of the pretty difficult technology. Uh, and so a lot of mechanical engineering is involved, a lot of biomedical engineering is involved. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about the different, um, you know, disciplines that are involved when we talk about the development of these products. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now we, let's go into kind of the chronic devices. These are called, these are the stents. And chronic devices are those devices, those are implanted into um, the body and then they stay on the body forever. Uh, so this is where uh, oh, the typical stent look, uh, looks like this. And you know, for kind of proportion view, I wanted to show what a typical stent looks like. So it's like a very fine, flexible structure typically, um, um, you know, platinum chromium kind of material. And these days um, they have got drug on, uh, coated on that. Uh, and these are actually delivered to um, the area of the, you know, veins, which have got occlusion. So before a plaque is, is, is the, um, you know, is the growth, this growth is basically depositions, right? Um, and these depositions are there that is kind of narrowing the vessel. Uh, it, the, the, the stent is taken on a balloon. The balloon is actually deflated. So you act, this is narrow when you get in there and then the balloon is inflated. As soon as the balloon is inflated, uh, the, this mesh, this structure is opened up and it stays there. And the balloon is then reduced and pulled back, All right? So, then after the procedure, the vein pr is propped open and it stays there. Now, this product may have drug over it to minimize the inflammation. Uh, this is a foreign body, it's staying there, but in order to minimize um, the inflammation and inflammation response could manifest in many different ways. In order to minimize the infl uh, inflammation, the, uh, these days there's drug and a lot of large number of family of drugs that are there, which are actually co uh, put on these stents. So these are dr drug coated stents. And these are, uh, these stay forever. So your, the evaluation of this prior to making these useful for humans is, is very extensive because um, the veins don't stay steady, right? So they, they, because the heart is pumping in the 60 beats per minute, there's flexing going on. And there is manipulation going on. Um, so you have to make sure that this one flexes for 60 times a minute, uh, 24 mm -hmm. hours a day, seven days a week, and for years and years, right? So um, that, that kind of flexibility has to be first tried on on the bench. Um, so typically it's like 400 million flexes is what you have to do for a 10 year life. Um, so that is the kind of um, you know engineering that goes on into the stamps. So, so let me ask you a slightly interesting question with it. At least to me, it is interesting that so from the initial design of these stamps through the your clinical trial to make sure it is correct, what's the the length of time it takes to go from initial design to that stage typically? Yeah. 
Short answer is four to five years, but mm -hmm. I will show you the timeline. And it depends on what kind of, do, what, what of is course. that? I have the precise answer in, in one of the slides currently. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. To that stance, um, let's talk a little bit about the structural heart disease. So this is a huge area where, um, you know, uh, there's a large number of population which have got valve issues, okay? In for these valve issues and mostly the, you know, mitral valve, mitral valve is actually on the left side of the heart um, where there's the manifestation is regurgitation. That means the wrong flow of the um, uh, of the blood. What uh, well, the there are artificial valves which are um, very intricate. Okay, the materials are typically the same from a structural standpoint. So these are platinum chromium um, material. Uh, however, you know the issue the 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 valves which open and close, uh, they are um, different um, uh, manufacturers have a slightly different combination of that. Again, the effort is um, that you have a valve which you need to go and deliver to the heart. Uh, you deliver it through a delivery system which is actually delivered again through a catheter through a groin. You don't open up the heart. So the, there are uh, previously before they opened up, uh, before they identified you know, these technologies, you had to open up the heart and then you had to put the valve there. Now you don't have to do that. Uh, you'll hear this terminology called TAVR, um, you know, trans aortic catheter valve replacement. Um, and uh, so you, this is again a small incision in the grain, uh, groin, take it through a catheter, fold it when you go, and then once you put it, you can open it up, and that's what it looks like. So this is a, a quick bad... question going back to the stand quickly. So yeah. uh, what type of bench testing is done for flexibility of stands? So, uh, yeah, so uh, there's a number of, uh, so big categories of testing. One is on the material side structurally um, uh, uh, for flex, flex testing. So you put this on um, a tube and then you flex it for, like I said, you know, 400 million cycles to reflect a tenure. Uh, but these, these, uh, um, um, these stents can go to 30, 40 years because there could be young kids who, who can get it, right? Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, the testing is mostly mechanical. Uh, uh, if it's drug coded, a number of drug uh, related testing so that the, 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 the side effects of the drug is very well known. And then uh, a lot of on, on the, um, you know, the material side so that there is no long-term effects. You know, there, some may, uh, you know, uh, in, in the previous generation of stents, there were issues around, you know, some stents causing cancer, but those problems have been rooted out. Uh, but those are kind of the testing. So you typically stay with the material that is already proven so that you don't create those issues. Uh, and you know that those materials are actually flexible enough. They are uh, proven over, uh, in humans over a long time. Then you make it much more easily deliverable is where the innovation goes, okay? Different sizes, because each person's vein is a little different. There's a range, but each person's vein is a little different. So you need to be able to customize um, uh, to that. And once you leave it there, it needs to stay there. And once it stays there, it needs to eliminate the issues. You don't want, again, stenosis to happen on that so that it does not clog again. So the, all the effort, all the innovation, all the engineering is actually going towards that. Very good, very good, thank you, go ahead. All right, so valves. Valves is a huge area where there's a lot of innovation going on and it's a complex um, uh, issue. Uh, it's, uh, and, and this, the, uh, manufacturing each valve, um, you know, in this way, in this day of automation, um, there's a lot of manual work that is done. Uh, so, and um, a lot of the factories are at, for for artificial valves are actually in uh, Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, because there is a lot of uh, manpower available with skill, a lot of skilled manpower available. Uh, they have a long legacy and 
almost every you know big manufacturer has got a plant somewhere in Malaysia, Singapore, that area uh, where they employ a large number of people who actually are manually you know sewing up uh, the, these valves. Uh, let's get into kind of the arrhythmia side of things. Okay, um, so uh, um, so tachycardia, bradycardia, electrical uh, uh, and irregular heartbeat. There is a big range of devices. I'll start with the most common one, which is called the pacemaker. So pacemaker is used for bradycard to treat bradycardia. Okay, so bradycardia is slow heart rate, and um, in, uh, so these devices are. Um, typically called a generator because these are pulses that are being generated. So I use the generator term loosely because these generators are going to be used for different things. So there's a generator which is actually implanted um, right, they have a cut uh, right around the collarbone, make a pocket, put it inside, and there are leads called, wire. these are the wires that go from these pacemakers into the heart, okay? now. The, these leads are working on the right side of the heart. Uh, as you may know, the right side of the heart, the blood actually goes to the lungs. So it is a relatively safer to work on the right side of the heart than the left side of the heart, because the left side of the heart is pure blood coming back from the lungs and going to the different parts of the body. So if you're messing with the left side of the heart, and if there's a clot, it can go either to your brain or to different parts of your body. And when there's a clot, uh, you know, it can stop blood. Uh, so um, the left, uh, right side of the heart is a little bit more forgiving. And so these leads, um, which are actually very complex structures are put on the right side into these chambers and at specific locations that, so that um, stimulation can happen at certain places, right? So, Let's say there's a bad tissue here for which the signal is not going from the upper chamber to the lower chamber. Because of this brain right here, the generator, uh, there's there will be stimulation on the top side and the generator will know after how much time uh, the stimulation needs to be done at the uh, lower chamber. So to replace the functionality of the heart or the proper you know, um, electrical stimulation at a different location, there's a generator which you know, actually does that. Uh, now, uh, pacemakers are low voltage pacing devices, battery life these days are much more than 10 years. Um, uh, these leads, imagine the, you know, the complexity that's needed because the heart is now pumping, right? And these are electrical wires and they have to be, you know, flexible again uh, for a large, um, in a number of years. Uh, and these devices are implanted all the way from, you know, babies to, uh, you know, people of all ages. So ma making sure that these leads are manufactured well, they stay over time um, is extremely important. Uh, and so making these leads at least 10 year warranty is, is absolutely important. And these chambers, you know, some of you who have had, you know, somebody or relative uh, have devices like this, have heard about single chamber or dual chamber. They come at single chamber, dual chamber. They are rate adaptive. That means they can sense the heart rate and then make the right kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, the rate changes. And these are on demand. If the heart is working well, it will not work. Okay, if the heart is not working well, then it's, it's, it's going to work. So it, 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 there's a lot of intelligence that's packed into this. So here is a one question, uh, what I understand, like uh, the way you need to regulate it could be different from one person to another one, right? So right. I've heard that more recently, you have the ability to have some wireless way to do it from outside. Uh, in fact, one of my friend has uh, these devices. Uh, you, uh, can you talk about it? Unless you are yeah. going to talk about that later. So yes, no. Thanks for bringing it up. I didn't want. Uh, I have not put it in there. So these devices have got. You can see some wires in there. These are actually antennas. These are RF antennas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So outside you have a um, a, a small device um, which is connecting to this pacemaker uh, over RF. 
Okay. And these days, actually, people are uh, putting in Bluetooth as well. Right. We have, the medical industry did not adopt Bluetooth for a long time because of security issues. Of course. Of okay. Course. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You do not want somebody to hack in and then modify the <laughs> former, right? Well, that's the biggest issue, right? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so now BLE or Bluetooth has come in a big way and it's secure and there's good amount of protocol. Uh, and you can actually, you know, what it does is the data from the device is picked up every minute of the day, every hour, and then it's transmitted to the hospital and at in hospitals, Nurses are looking at only those where the rhythms are, uh, you know, not normal. Right. Okay. Right. So mm -hmm. there's somebody looking after you all the time. Okay. And if you have an abnormal, maybe you don't even know the nurse will call you. Hey, we saw an irregular heartbeat here, or there's some issues. What is? Are you feeling okay? <clears throat> and they say, Hey, I'm I'm feeling a little dizzy. So mm -hmm. they're going to change the medication a little bit or change the heart rate remotely. Correct. So those are all possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to give you a perspective of what is the size of these devices, uh, you can compare it to like a one rupee, right? So the one rupee <coughs> coin, and it's just a little bit bigger than a rupee coin, right? And the thickness obviously is a little big. The thickness is maybe two to three uh, millimeters, uh, um, and maybe up to about five millimeters in certain cases, but they're very small. <clears throat> in a pacemakers, which nobody would even know when you, when you put it in here. So that's on the pacemaker side of things for low heart rate. Now for <clears throat> one other uh, new innovation that's happening these days is these leads. I talked about how some these leads have to stay there for a long amount of time and people grow, right? When kids grow, the length and size changes. Now in that case, you have to pull the lead out and insert another set of leads. Now, um, as the lead sits there, tissue grows around it. So in order to extract them, it's a huge deal. So what's happening in the medical industry these days is making of leadless pacemakers, okay? So leads are going away. You're actually taking this whole generator, packaging it to this, a small device like this here and inserting right into the heart and anchoring it right at the tip of the heart. So, and, and this can go on forever. One definite issue with this is, you know, uh, battery in a small package, you know, putting in a lot of battery is an, an issue. So a lot of uh, in, innovation is going on in the space so that you can actually retrieve it and put a new one uh, because the longevity is not that long today. But that's where the industry is gonna go on the pacemaker side of things so that you know, these leads and the complication of leads go away. Uh, let's talk about tachycardia. Tachycardia is fast heart rate. In order to reduce the fast heart rate or bring it back to a normal, you sort of have to shock. And um, there could be external defibrillators where that you see in malls or in, in a big organizations where and on TVs, they put a pedal uh, against your, your chest in the back and they, they actually reset uh, your heart. These are implantable defibrillators. Um, and these uh, defibrillators are placed at the same location, you know, have got uh, leads that are able to deliver high energy. But in a sense, um, you know, these are the ones that actually deliver a high, you know, high energy shocks, 40 joule shocks uh, in order to reset the heart from high rates. You know, I talked about 150 to 200 beats per minute back to the 60 to 70 beats per minute, right? Um, the package, the electronics is actually fairly small inside. The reason for this package to be a little bit big is because there's a lot of battery and a lot and huge capacitors that are needed in order to build up that kind of energy. Uh, so the battery a life question, is actually, yes. A question here is that, uh, can we put a rechargeable battery there now? Are you getting to that point? Yes. Uh, so rechargeable battery for implanted device is um, actually fairly common in other um, uh, other uses where there's low energy, uh, which means uh, pacemakers are beginning to get that. 
these kind of stimulation devices are available for stimulating the spinal cord for pain management. Their uh, use of rechargeable batteries are fairly common. Mm -hmm. uh, it is most, uh, so it is going there. Uh, okay. it, uh, but to uh, build up uh, the 40 joule shock energy, you know, many, uh, you know, many such shocks during the lifetime that requires a large amount of energy to be recharged. All right, so um, it's not that technology is fully uh, not out there yet, but it, that, that's where every, everyone's going. And we are also looking at whether you, a smaller amount of energy will also work or not. So it is all these devices are capable of high um, high joule shocks, but certain patients may need actually twenty joule shocks and may be good enough. In the, in their cases, uh, their battery life is definitely a lot longer. I see. Okay, of course. And then if you are getting this kind of information through wireless, uh, then you can, you know, uh, whoever doctor or is monitoring it, they will be able to also know that, okay, which one is working there. And yes, you can estimate the lifetime of the battery based on that, you know, I suspect. Absolutely. So that's a very important part, you know, where is the battery at and uh, to call the patient back uh, in order to, uh, you know, do a replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes because, you know, the patient is not needing it, a patient may even forget where the battery is at, right? Uh, you do get some kind of a, uh, you know, signal when the battery is low, you get a, hear a beep, mm -hmm. um, but elderly people may actually miss the beep, right? So there, so uh, the remote technology or remote monitoring is extremely helpful. One and question there, uh, Reza, is that with remote technology, when was the first time the remote uh, wireless thing was introduced in uh, beyond clinical trial in, in actual patient? How recently? Yeah, so so um, inductive telemetry, uh, which is where the first remote kind of programming or remote uh, has been there since like the 90s, early 90s. Okay. But the um, RF technology actually came in mid 2000, uh, the first decade in, 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 in this century. So maybe around 2004, 2005. Uh, and Bluetooth is um, in a 2012, 2015, around that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and this remote communication <clears throat> uh, is, and, take, and folks taking a piece of the device home actually has happened since about 2007, uh, where at which point, you know, the office, office visits have come down and remote visits have gone up. Okay. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, secure software work uh, that uh, has been done in this area. Um, and there's a, a lot of, um, you know, uh, innovation that has gone into making sure that the device and the data is not lost. Uh, not device, but the data is not lost because every single piece of information uh, is very important. So there's a lot of redundancy, redundancy in the communication as it goes back and forth. And also the data you collect is from multiple different patients of yeah. different age group, uh, ethnic background can also uh, help you to kind of say how to improve the devices for the next generation of uh, you know, devices, I presume, right? Yeah, I mean, that's such rich data that to you know, analyze or... You know, um, you but this know. is a good data problem now suddenly you have. So huge amount of data coming in because you're monitoring a lot of stuff. I mean, very, very frequently and you're collecting, you know, some kind of a cloud or wherever you're collecting the data and then analyzing, you know, whether you use some kind of a regression models or machine learning models, you know, that's really, it's a interesting thing in itself, I guess, as this kind of a side business coming out of all this stuff, right? I mean, right. Yeah. part of your so, company's job, but it's a new thing for a company to address right now. Right, so a lot of AI and uh, you know, big data uh, work has gone on in this space to be able to uh, you know, mine that data and understand. Um, and this could be from many different parts of the world, right? So, uh, and since the world is very mobile these days, um, you know, patients are going from one location to another, um, and you're, you're getting you're getting very high quality data, very rich data over a very short period of time. 
Um, so defibrillators are another, you know, pretty significant technology. Previously, you know, these packages were very big. Uh, it was very unmanageable. Now, you know, just to compare this with the pacemakers, it's a little bit bigger. So the pacemaker that I showed in the previous slide, if you compare that with the uh, defibrillator, it's only the header part is a little bit bigger. Other than that, uh, you know, it's al almost as uh, as small. So these these packages have gotten smaller and smaller and very manageable. Even a lean person, uh, you know, when they have this, and especially women, uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't even see uh, a small structure. You know, the, these these devices have become really small. Now, uh, one other thing that's ha happening in the innovation here is, um, you know, uh, defibrillators are going uh, subcutaneous, easy to implant. Uh, and easy to um, uh, you know manage, and in, instead of the leads going inside the heart, where the leads are going outside of the heart. So this is another way the you know defibrillators are being made, so that it's a small outpatient surgery. You're staying away from the heart, and you're you know you you have the same kind of effect. Um, quickly getting into you know another pretty uh, significant uh, technology here. Um, uh, so far with the, um, with the pacemakers and defibrillators, you're managing the heart, you're managing the symptoms. You're not actually eliminating the basic issues. Cardiac ablation is where you do a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, attack the basic concerns. So cardiac ablation uh, to treat, and uh, you know, it, is, it is a, a, a uh, treatment for atrial and ventricular fibrillation. Fibrillation is again an irregular heart. So when the signals are not propagating down properly and they are churning in, in these chambers, uh, what uh, the treatment is, you take catheters and you burn certain tissues. And typical tissues that are problematic are the tissues around the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins are these veins that are, uh, you know, getting the blood from the and the lungs. Uh, and so um, typical treatment is actually going and, uh, and uh, ablating or burning tissues around, around these veins. So you go in there, you map out uh, the, the whole chamber, and then you do um, you know, the burning. So this is fascinating technology because you need a mapping system to go map. So you have a catheter with multiple electrodes that is actually inserted to map the heart. And then you have an RF technology-based ablation catheter to go inside and burn tissues. So this is- So does uh, it also the, take pictures as you go on and take a uh, video yet or not yet there quite? Yeah, yet. so there are cameras that are coming in uh, with this, but right now what's happening is when you can see this, you know, this monitor here with an image. So these are what is called magnetically, uh, you know, loaded uh, catheters. And there is a another generator that can actually look, find out the location of this particular um, uh, catheter inside the heart body, and then they can recreate and visualize that uh, on on the screen. So that okay. the okay, very interesting. So so that the physician actually knows where exactly is the catheter and what the shape is and where the signals are coming from. But to your point, on these catheters. There are, you know, cameras and LEDs that are being placed now so that you can actually capture and then see tissues. What we see today is mostly the electrical view of things. The tissue view of things can be seen by these catheters. That's correct. Nowadays, and those are coming. So, so those are already deployed or available, or is it still under uh, engineering stage for the ones with the cameras? And uh... so. Uh, in, in the world of card cardiovascular devices, there is not one yet, but that technology is not new. Endoscopes, mm -hmm. and they use a right, that's cameras correct. Only. Right, okay. right, right. Uh, but in, in, in any of these big companies who are actually leading 90% of 95% of the market, there isn't a product yet. We are working on one that we're not, we, I can tell you. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so RF ablation catheters is one big technology for. Uh, you know, treating uh, fibrillation. The other one is, so RF basically does burning. You can burn two ways. You can burn by heat or you can burn by cold, right? 
So uh, RF use, uses heating to burn, but there's cryoablation also where you have a balloon and the balloon is uh, inflated by nitrous oxide gas. And nitrous oxide gas is very low in temperatures. Uh, and then that, when you take and touch a tissue with the balloon, that tissue actually freezes to the point that it dies. So cryotechnology is another big technology that's coming up and it's very uh, easy and it's quick. It comes with a balloon. So when you had, when you had to do uh, ablation point by point, you can put a balloon in there and then you can burn a circle really quickly. Uh, so this uh, cryotechnology is gaining a ton of ground and a lot of um, the companies are coming out these days with, with, with cryotechnology using nitrous oxide and you know, balloons. Uh, one other um, piece that I want for, com for completeness I want to talk about is what is called cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, it does use a stimulator, a, a pulse generator, but now you have actually three leads. One goes to the atrium, one to the ventricle, and one to the left side. And this, this therapy is there for um, folks uh, or, or the diseases around heart failure so that you can pump the heart appropriately from all ways. Uh, you need three leads to actually um, uh, to be implanted. So cardiac resynchronization therapy is kind of the latest in the evolution, but it's still about 15 years old, okay? And these have gotten much more um, this pacing at different parts of the heart. So you, you can see this, this particular lead has got you know, three elect or four electrodes pacing at different frequencies at different times at different locations are becoming you know, kind of the new ways of managing the heart failure patients. So you know, that's all I could pack in in terms of the devices. Let's talk a little bit about how engineering and medical devices are there. And I should be able to take about 10 more minutes and then you should be able to wrap it up. That's great, that's fine, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So that's typically in engineering of medical devices, what you do is you start with improvement of a current product, okay? The, there are some deficiencies that you have heard from the uh, patients, uh, from physicians, and you take that product and uh, somebody has thought about a new way of uh, you know, incorporating some sensors. So one of the typical things that we're doing these days are putting some sound sensors into this uh, into the devices so that you can actually understand what the you know sound uh, um, is inside your body. And sound can tell you a lot of things. Sound can tell you what kind of uh, hydration you have, uh, what rate, uh, and are they repetitive, are they regular? A, a lot of you know sounds at different locations can tell you a ton of things. So that is one, let's say, improvement of a current product. So you take a current product, look for an improvement, and try to prove a concept. Even during concept time, you have a marketing person in there, a mechanical engineer, a prototype person, preclinical scientist. So what a preclinical scientist does is takes the prototype and you know uh, works with a, a, a with an animal. Okay, so these are veterinarians essentially. So the amount of discipline that is involved in making a product is huge. Um, you take them, um, and in order to program these, you need software engineers, firmware engineers for materials and uh, testing. You need biomedical engineers um, for chemical engineers to make sure that there's good coating and there's no, um, you know, rejection by the body. Obviously, electrical engineers to, you know, to build the entire circuitry, and also you involve physician customers. So. Even at concept, there's a there's a lot of you know different disciplines that are that you know that, that are involved. Then you get into product development. Obviously, the team grows now, and you're um, it, it not just enough to you know have a product that is designed, but that needs to be manufactured and manufactures consistently and precisely over time. So, process development, you know, to be able to use robots, to be able to use you know good testing um, and um, to be able to um, you know, re do it over millions and millions of devices um, are extremely important. By regulation, we need to have a separate quality assurance group that is independent of the development team. And so there, 
they are they come in the form of design assurance, they come in the form of quality assurance, and they're tracking not just during development, but after the product is out in the field for years, years until the life of the product. And you, one has to be able to trace which batch of components came for a particular device at any point in time. So even before, you know, um, companies like Oracle or SAP had built databases, medical device industry had built databases way before that. Mm -hmm. So we know relational database and that kind of work uh, from, you know, from years ago. I'm talking about um, 1970s, 80s, where we started building these kind of, you know, databases to be able to track. And these are all homegrown. These are all, you know, uh, um, built on IBM mainframes so, you know, way back. Um, so a lot of quality assurance happens. Um, we have to keep the documentation in great shape uh, all along. There are two terminologies that you may come in, to, you know, um, uh, you'll hear when you get into this industry. One is called the design history file. The design history file or the DHF has to be in great shape and it needs to be able to show every generation of the product uh, and and these devices are there from you know 30 40 years old right so these have to be kept and then the design master file which is the dmr which shows where the components came from what material what testing was done and that traceability has to happen for years years and years so you need documentation control specialists so these folks are working on specific documentation control systems to be able to track then you need people with you know, good literature and labeling background, you know, um, folks that are working in the, uh, you know, in, in uh, let's say an MA in English can have a great career in, in, the, in the medical device industry, looking at uh, the literature labeling the manuals and the, you know, and the materials that are, um, that, that are patient facing or physician facing. So um, a lot of people, um, you know, are involved with different kinds of skills. Um, then there are biostatisticians. These are people with math and or um, um, statistics background can all have, have a great career in, in this industry. Um, few folks that are interested in you know, talking to customers and uh, are um, interested in playing with medical uh, devices. They not, do not necessarily be engineers, but they are, uh, they can have, uh, but they are, uh, they're interested in technology, they can learn um, they can be in the field and they can work with uh, the, the physicians. That's a different kind of skill. Um, even M, uh, MDs, that means um, you know, physicians who are interested in actually working in the industry rather in, in, in or maybe more indirectly patient care, they can have a great career you know, in, in medical devices. And also, you know, we are very closely working with our, our customers all the time. They come and uh, go into our facilities you know, doing the testing. So one big part of the product development is actually doing testing on animals. And these animal studies are, are, um, you know, are very important uh, because they give us kind of the first insight into real tissues of how these devices are working. Um, and they have to be uh, tested with good laboratory practices. So you cannot you know, uh, go and test it in animal until unless it is um, you know, the, it is safe for the animals as well. And you are actually working, you cannot put an animal to any kind of distress. So there's a lot of regulations around how to use animals in terms of this testing. It, there's a lot of ethics involved. And so there's, there is, there's very good control around making sure that, um, you know, the, these tests are, uh, are needed. These, these are effective and these are um, not putting the, the, the animals in, uh, in distress, right? So, uh, and so uh, the regulatory agencies are very, very careful and there's a lot of um, you know, regulations around making sure that uh, do, those studies are done right. So this is where the bulk of the investment happens. So this is and where then, I got a yeah. question here, Reza, is that um, since uh, you're starting with uh, improving a current product, obviously you have certain knowledge of the product. Right. So in a sense, this part of uh, the product development sort of works like a feedback control, right? Because you get something from what you know, and then you add something to it. They say, hey, we learned something from the field uh, because you said you have been collecting data from before. 
for the device. Uh, did I get that right, sort of? Yes, yes. In 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 there are you know incremental or inch up improvements mm -hmm. uh, in order to in continuously improve the product, which is what you're talking about. There's a feedback loop. Right. There are disruptive improvements also, which I'll talk uh -huh. about in the next slide okay. uh, a little bit. And, and uh, I have one more question. Maybe I don't know where it fits into your cycle. That uh, the the manufacturing challenges. Uh, I didn't see anything on this slide here. Somebody asked a question about it, so you can okay. talk through it later if that's that's. Good. Let me cover it right here. Um, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Let me cover it right here. Mm -hmm. So manufacturing is extremely important because um, you have to do this in clean rooms. Clean rooms meaning um, there are regulations of how many parts per million of foreign material that you can have. Um, and so these are actually done in, um, um, in highly regulated uh, temperature controlled um, in uh, foreign material controlled you know, labs. Uh, and these labs are, um, are run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? Uh, and so th there is a lot of climate environment control in making this happen. <clears throat> One big part of this is making sure that the components that are coming in are regulated very appropriately uh, for, and they've got very tight tolerances. So the vendors, the uh, companies who supply the components also have to follow a number of regulations, okay? And uh, they just don't have to follow, they are actually audited as well. So the entire medical device industry has got, uh, you know, uh, has been, and this is not anything new, this has been there for our, uh, for a long time. Um, and, and so the industry is used to basically putting all of this um, you know, controls in place. So barrier of entry because of all these regulations are um, uh, is very difficult. But once you are in there and you can pursue, produce these devices, there are not too many of you who are in the market who can produce this. Um, and um, it, 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 the um, and to be able to control, to be able to uh, you know keep their records, to be able to produce over and over, uh, because certain materials get obsolete. You know, some some material that was um, uh, deemed to be good, the previously are now uh, are not useful for or are harmful for, let's say, pregnant women, right? Uh, and newer information comes along, and it starts obsoleting the materials, or it starts to put materials. Uh, you know, that ha had been used before, um, you know, uh, they cannot be used anymore. So there's a lot of innovation that they do as well. So <clears throat> the medical device industry collectively is working together to make sure that they are exchanging information in a big way um, amongst themselves so that if they have found certain things in one of their products, they're sharing with the others so that the others don't make the same mistakes. And, you know, just to go back to the manufacturing question is, the regulations and the controls that is that is to be done in order to make these devices uh, is is um, is huge. I mean, uh, because there are a lot of electronics that are involved in in this piece, um, a, a lot of the design for manufacturability improvements that were made in other industries have been leveraged by the medical invest industry from the get go. Um, you know, all of the work that the Japanese folks did around you know building cars <clears throat> a lot of those technologies have come in actually way back in the 80s and early 90s into the medical industry to be able to you know <clears throat> manufacture high you know six sigma has been our language for a long time now i see yeah you have to have probably more than six sigma if you yeah. think about precision <laughs> point of view or being correctly working it yep mm -hmm. all right Okay, so then we get into clinical trials, uh, human clinical trials. <clears throat> These tri trials are a little bit different. So let's talk about kind of parallels to the COVID vaccine and all that here. Uh, <clears throat> in, in, in devices world, <clears throat> what you're typically doing is mostly one set of trial, okay? In the drug world, you do, um, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. In, in the medical devices world, you typically have one set of trial um, because most of the information is known, okay? If there's completely novel information, completely new information, then you have to do a phase one, phase two, phase three. But typically in the world of medical devices, 
since you are actually leveraging your previous information. So the industry is a little bit slow from that standpoint. However, uh, you know, you're not doing, um, you know, three phase trials, they're single phase trials, uh, but they can be long. Um, so there's a, the couple of interesting things here is um, there has to be a defined protocol uh, and the protocol will, ha will have defined uh, success criteria, failure criteria and success criteria. Those are um, you know, submitted to the regulatory authority. You have to have an independent steering committee uh, of um, uh, physicians who are actually looking at. You have to have what is called a data monitoring safety board that is looking at the data that's coming in. So I cannot evaluate my own data, right? <laughs> Uh, I have to give it to somebody independent right. to show what the data looks like. Mm -hmm. I cannot conduct my own trial. I have to give it to research coordinators. I have to give him, give them the protocol and then say, go test it for this mm -hmm. and get the data. That data actually comes and goes to the data safety monitoring board who's actually looking at and generating the statistics. <clears throat> and the and this is within the are, same company you're talking about. What's that? This is even within the same company that you are talking about that they yeah, are so the, completely kind of separated it out, right? Sort no, of. no, no. Actually, these are people outside. Ah, these That's are why outside. I have this okay. in different color, mm -hmm. right? So independent means truly independent. It's truly independent. Okay. Yeah. We we actually have contracts and then we have, have to pay them for their services, uh, but they are doing their work. Uh, they're not part of you know our company. They they are they're the experts in their area and they're brought up uh, brought in and then uh, you know, they, 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 uh, we have mechanisms to kind of share the data directly without us, us touching it at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so then the research coordinators were actually conducting their research at every hospital. You'll see a research wing, uh, and these research coordinators are, you know, executing the protocol, collecting the data. Investigators are actually performing the, you know, the, the devices. And then obviously there are patients. So this whole, there's a huge part of independent piece to it. <clears throat> and so when we are talking about the COVID vaccine, you know, how effective it is and, you know, how diff <clears throat> you know, whether it's being done properly or not, these vaccines have been, are beginning to come out in a very short time. What it used to take five years is now taking nine, 10 months. Um, but these, these, these um, you know, processes, are, are age old and they are very, you know, well understood in the world of clinical research. Okay. So, okay. and they're very independent. Mm -hmm. So whatever results you see from those, at least in, in the, you know, in the US uh, and in the Western world, uh, these people are very independent. And this is where, if this, uh, these are not done well, um, you know, companies get into problems. So. Startups in this space can only run for a certain amount of time. And then the startup is actually bought by a bigger company so that they can actually run this because these are high cost investment uh, uh, try, you know, work, mm -hmm. right? So when FDA comes out with a report uh, of a particular um, you know, performance, these can be really relied upon because they are going through a very independent set of people who are you know, not motivated in, uh, <clears throat> who are not financially motivated in generating a certain set of results. They're motivated, they're scientists and they're actually motivated in making sure that the right data is, um, uh, is produced. And even after that, you know, there is a panel that looks at all of the data um, and that panel makes a recommendation as to whether the product is to be approved or not. And, each country has got a, you know, their own regulatory agency in the U.S. Um, you know, there's an FDA. FDA is pretty strict from a standpoint that you actually have to give all your data, and they will do their own analysis. Uh, in Europe, uh, those uh, there are what is called notified bodies. These are actually companies who know the regulations, who are certified by the EU. Uh, uh, for the <clears throat> on these regulations, and these notified bodies can go to the companies and look at their products. So it's not like one forum, uh, but these are small companies who are very knowledgeable on the regulations, and then they go do the evaluation with the companies, uh, and they are authorized to pro provide what is called a CE mark of the products. 
Japan has got another organization called PMDA. China has their own <coughs> um, agency called NMPA. India has um, their agency called C CDSCO. So these are all independent organizations. And for approval to work, uh, uh, you know, have access to that market, industry has to submit to each of these independent bodies. Um, you know, and so there's a long, um, uh, you know, there, there's a very strong regulatory team in each of these um, companies. And then, um, you know, they work with these regulation, uh, regulatory bodies very fairly regularly in, uh, in order to get the products approved. Sometimes in, you know, countries like India, they say, okay, if FDA has approved, we will not need to do anything more. Um, in certain countries uh, in the Commonwealth, uh, 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 there could be, okay, if the product is approved in uh, uh, Europe, um, there's a lesser burden in Australia, let's say, uh, to say, give us this additional stuff, we'll leverage the uh, EU or Europe C mark uh, and uh, look at this additional work. So they all also sort of work together in terms of, um, you know, making sure that we're actually not doing the same work multiple times. So your earlier question, how long does it take? A very a small change in your product could be about one and a half years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. about one to one and a half years, a very long duration trial that could push you out to four or five years. I mean, typically these trials are three years, um, you know, three and a half year. Um, and if all goes well, I, I you know, I'm probably under the four years, it, it, it gets into the five year time in the horizon. All right, my last slide here. So okay. how do medical devices get approved? You know, typical decision-making criteria is whether it's a diagnostic product or it's a therapeutic product. The diagnostic is you're just collecting data, okay? Uh, how much, uh, what's my sugar level, right? You're not doing anything. You're not giving any drug, but you're just testing. So whether it's a diagnostic product or a therapeutic product. Therapeutic, you are actually delivering some, some therapy and you're looking for some effect. But it's a single use device or is an implantable device. Well, it's a novel therapy or it is equivalent to a prior device. You are just making, let's say, manufacturable manufacturability inf improvements, but it is pretty much equivalent to the previous product. You're driving cost low, but not changing any features. But novel therapy could be, hey, we're burning tissue with a heat or cold. Uh, maybe there's a different signal that we can send in order to burn certain tissue selectively. Right, so that would be a novel therapy. So, which is what's coming out also, and that will be evaluated in a different way. And regulatory agencies are extremely, you know, interested in looking at hazards. What are the new hazards, or what are the change in the effectiveness? So, these all, you know, help in trying to make a decision of what kind of, you know, regulatory path is to be used. Is there a pre-market study path that is um, that the manufacturer should have? or a sub substantial equivalent path. So these are kind of two typical paths that they take. So sponsor, meaning an industry player, submits all of the data to a regulatory body and makes a, an argument that we want to take a substantial equivalent path or the pre-market path. The regulatory agency might come back and then say, no, this is not substantial equivalent. You have to go to the pre-market path. If it's a pre-market path, then they, there's a protocol that is submitted. The protocol is approved. The sponsor create, you know, conducts the trial. And once the trial is con, uh, you know, submitted, um, uh, completed, the data is submitted to the regulatory body and then you get a, a product approved. If it's a substantial equivalent path, you, can, you don't need to do any clinical data. And then the product is basically based and you know, reviewed and evaluated based off of the bench data or the animal data and the predicate data. Predicate means previous devices data, and you combine all of that, and then you get approval for it. So <clears throat> this is how this, I packed it out in one slide, but this, this, uh, this, is, this industry, the regulations, uh, regulated industry has got a huge uh, in our role to play in getting medical devices approved. So that was my last slide. Great, um, that was very good. Slide. I hope uh, that was useful. Very, uh, very useful. Time but, for questions, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm here to take any okay. questions now. So uh, let me read a couple of questions and at least one person wanted to ask you uh, by uh, through audio. So let me re read the question there a couple of, one of the question was that if it is a pacemaker for an athlete versus a sedentary lifestyle, you know, they're different. How can you choose 
which one will be better? Is there something you need to, in, from a design perspective, you take into account or you have a different type of devices for the different lifestyles? Um, no, there are no different, different devices are basically based on the diseases, mm -hmm. uh, not on lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do keep in mind when you are implanting a particular lead, the age or the lifestyle. Let's say you are looking at somebody who, uh, whose diseases, uh, this is, is in the early state and it is going to progress later. So you put a device that can cater to future, you know, situations of the diseases. Um, or if you're thinking that, uh, you know, this is a young 26 year old uh, person who needs to be very effective you know, in the life today for the next 25, 30 years, then you're putting a device which, is, which suits uh, the person's kind of lifestyle. So you may choose a different location to put it, or you may choose a different profile of the device to put it. Uh, but more, the, that decision is sort of a later, the more important decision is what is the disease that the patient is to, is to be treated on. I see, very good. Uh, one other question is, do you collaborate with uh, NIH? Do you need to do work with NIH for devices, for example? Uh, very closely. Um, I mean, NIH does a lot of you know, foundational work, uh, you know, innovative work. Um, we, um, have, you know, uh, wor we, we work with the physicians at the NIH or the researchers or the scientists um, in, in terms of mostly uh, innovative novel areas. So sounds or technology for different, using different frequencies. Those ideas have born out of, you know, collaboration with, with NIH. Okay, very good. Uh, I think one of the persons uh, wanted to ask you a question by audio. So uh, sure. I think his name is Nilot Paul. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, uh, hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yeah. I can. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your time, sir. Uh, I, ha I had a question about uh, product development in cryoablation. Uh, yes. So <clears throat> I remember you mentioned in one of your slides uh, that uh, you use uh, some cooling gases like uh, nitrogen or helium uh, to freeze the tissue to death uh, inside the body. Uh, so I was just wondering that, uh, so there is another technology uh, called air breathing engines that is being used for uh, development of hypersonic planes. So they use a similar technology to actually uh, cool uh, this atmospheric air in fraction of a second. So they basically use uh, some uh, five miles of uh, thread-like pipes. They are uh, just clubbed together in the form of a small device, and they act as small heat exchangers. They uh, they can uh, basically reduce the temperature to some 200 degrees Fahrenheit in fraction of a second. So I was just wondering, like, uh, what, like, relatively, what is the time taken by uh, the device in cryoablation uh, to actually uh, like reduce the temperature of the tissue? Like, is it comparable or uh, is it slower or faster? Um, so nitrous oxide, you know, normal gaseous, you know, it, it's, its temperature is really low. So it's actually a fraction of a second. There's, uh, <clears throat> so it's packed in cylinders. Okay, these, these come um, in cylinders and are uh, in the lab. And with the help of a tube, actually taken to the, to the balloon once it's inflated. So... There is actually no time. It's the, the delivery of the gas from one point to another is all that's needed. So it's a fraction of a second. Okay. So in that case, so when you develop a product, when you uh, like ideate on the product, so uh, do you focus on uh, reducing the treatment time based on what the client asks you or on an absolute basis, like as much as possible? As much as possible. You know, lab time is so important. Um, that uh, we are looking at in the product, in the workflow, wherever there's a lot of time consumed. And we are going to go after those and make sure that we bring in technology to be able to minimize that amount of time. Um, it is a race amongst <laughs> the different companies, not based on uh, what the, uh, sometimes the customer may not know what what, uh, what is possible, right? So it is mostly a mostly uh, us kind of trying to minimize time okay. uh, and so get I a product one, advantage. Thank you, sir. I have one more last question. Like, 
uh, for product development of this like complex medical devices like do you generally prefer some uh, phd people or actually uh, who are like experts in the field or uh, even uh, you know some uh, master degree people can actually get to work on such technology actually you don't even certainly there are roles for everyone okay you don't need master degree or phd i mean depends on obviously what area you want to work on um you know like i said you can have a, a ma or ba in english and can have a great career in the medical device industry because there's a need for it right <clears throat> and you can be a phd or an md and can still have a, you have a great career in that so if you are and this is a growing industry it is um is one of the high growth industries so if you if you are interested in getting in this, this industry there there's a job for you <laughs> yeah for example you talked about literature and labeling that is yeah. very important to have a degree in uh, english or mass communication right. because it's very important to be able to communicate that but also understand the device part of it you know technical part of it so and uh, going to it's a very good question that nilot pol ask i think and so uh, even you have undergraduate uh, students i mean to bachelor's degree students work at different phases of uh, this products like uh, development i'm pretty sure right so yeah. yep very good question let's uh, thank you nilot pol uh, there is another uh, person who wanted to ask question uh, manuj i think his name please go ahead manuj yes, unmute yourself uh, good evening sir uh, maybe I had some questions for you, but before to that, I would like to add some answers, not answers, like as an example to give what Nilot Pol has asked. Like he asked about, I'm also, uh, maybe, maybe I should give some background about my work. I'm also in the medical device field, but uh, not directly what you are working in. My field is in the laparoscopic devices and uh, neurosurgery devices. So mostly like uh, trocars and all those stuff, not so high, uh, high risk devices uh, our are like very medium to low risk devices we manufacture and thank you for nicely elaborating the regulatory part because i'm from the regulation uh, i take care of the us market and uh, europe market and also canada and uh, australia market so what nimit pol has asked like uh, having a degree uh, maybe i should say that i have a phd degree like uh, in india i had a master in chemistry and i came to taiwan i'm based in taiwan now i came to taiwan and i did phd in biophysics so i translated all my uh, knowledge and skills to be a part in the regulation industry of the medical device field so maybe that should also encourage other people like uh, what new people has asked okay yes, absolutely okay very okay, good maybe... good to know about you thank you, <laughs> thank Although, you so what you have a question also i think right yeah i do have some questions yeah. okay like uh, as sir has said that uh, about going more wireless the technology uh, so for last couple of years fda is quite concerned about the getting not getting it but uh, that they're saying that the softwares they are using in the remote technologies are quite hackable like not uh, not yet hacked but there is a chance that it could be hacked in the future so what is your opinion like as a patient uh, one should be worrying about that like if someone hacked the device and get the control of the device so what is your opinion is it a real threat to the patient not anymore <coughs> see <coughs> um re remote connection or wireless connection has been there for quite some time but the medical industry did not go in there precisely because of this concern about uh, you know <clears throat> somebody hacking from outside right so in spite of all of that development so the industry has been working on developing developing that protocol for a long time and it started implementing it um let let's say from about 10 12 years ago maybe 15 years ago now Uh, in spite of all of the work there have been uh, some security lapses um so but those lapses are now very well understood and those have been you know replicated but technology keeps you know changing right so initially i uh, there was rf induct uh, inductive telemetry then became rf telemetry then um, there are some specific protocols then bluetooth so 
the innovation continues and the industry has not let the guard down um, at all. So I, there is no concern from a, uh, from a, a patient standpoint because the industry is super sensitive about it. The whole industry is, uh, if there's one instance, the manufacturer is very careful in making sure that, that, that problem is very well understood uh, before more products are sold. So from a patient perspective, there's no concern about it. Okay, uh, in relation to that, one more question. Like uh, when you do the design verification at the design verification stage or validation stage, so uh, you put some mitigation for that risk, right? Like even though it's uh, quite negligible of getting hacked, so you still put some uh, mitigation. So at what stage you put that mitigation in the verification or in like clinical trial stage? Uh, actually, real mitigation is during development. Okay. Um, uh, when in in term in verification, sometimes you use independent agencies, independent companies, where you send the product out and have them kind of try to break it, try to hack it, uh, based on their technology, right? <clears throat> um, based on what they know and what they're used to, um, because these security can be not at the former or the software level; they can be at the hardware level as well, right? So um, you sometimes engage other agencies to be able to do you know some kind of taste testing um, so that you can uh, uh, incorporate that even before it goes to the verification validation stage okay so last 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 question about the, the uh, you say that uh, when you get the data from the patient about uh, of using the devices so you use now you use artificial intelligence so uh, in the medical device field now it's quite growing the use of artificial intelligence, but mostly it is still in the, the IVD, like in vitro diagnostic stage, right? So what is your perspective about utilizing the artificial intelligence to get the real-time information? Uh, suppose I get a, a electronic device implanted in my heart, for example, and how one could use the artificial intelligence in the device so that uh, it can give you, before it is happening, it can give you a sense that it could happen in the future or in like real time, it could give you some data. So artificial intelligence in my view is going to be used for uh, more diagnosis yeah. uh, at a mass level rather than individualized. Okay, okay. so <clears throat> you get data from uh, a, you know, many different parts of the world for many different demographics, many different population you actually mine that information to actually say what is actually going on in a particular set of population rather than a particular individual. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> one small use on an individualized basis is how is the patient breathing? How is the patient's you know, heart sound changing, right? Mm -hmm. So you use some of that information to make predictive work. Say, hey, the heart failure is progressing in this person. Uh, and so we need to adjust the drugs or we need to adjust the you know, timing of the device. Um, so that's one individualized area of sort of predictive therapy that you can do, uh, but more artificial intelligence will, will be to find out you know, population-based issues or uh, to predict um, you know, what is going on in a particular area or population or based on their food habits. Let's say a group of people in uh, Africa is demonstrating so-and-so, um, and you are going to be able to use artificial intelligence to actually, um, you know, uh, to decipher that and maybe able to use that information to predict, uh, you know, some of the other diseases that are happening that could be prevented. Okay. Let, let, let me add one thing to, that's a very good question. Let me add one thing to it. There are other reasons you don't want to use AI in the, in real time, uh, uh the, the reason is that you know anything you do with AI is basically you do based on a training set and a test set side of an idea in a very high level way to look at it. So if your training set is biased, for example, for some reason, like what uh, Reza just talked about, depending on the population of one part or another, what could happen, it may not be actually perfectly fitting for an individual person. And this is where the clinicians are extremely important. You give them the, from the prediction what Reza talked about the results and the clinicians actually, because they're monitoring it, they can say, hey, you need to change it or you know, 
change the rate, you know, going back to pacemaker rate or whatever for, for, for that part of it. But real time, and other reason, I don't think the device makers, I may be wrong, may not want to get into real time because if one incident happens that went wrong, that company is totally shut, you know, <laughs> worldwide. So you nobody wants to take that sort of a risk also. So there's a major, major risk factor. Yeah, it's a person's life, right? So the liability is yep, very high. Exactly. Very good question. Uh, thank you for you know, sharing your knowledge of uh, Manus for, for from your uh, working in the regulatory industry. So this way, this is, we got to know you also. That's very good. There's one last question for uh, Reza. Uh, what is LVAD? Uh, yeah. If you could answer that and we'll close it. Right. Mm -hmm. But LVAD is left ventricular assist device. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the heart becomes very big and is not able to pump on their own, let me kind of go back to, yeah. When the heart becomes big and is not able to, um, you know, pump on its own, you put a mechanical device around it and try to push the left ventricle because left importance of left ventricle is that it has got the freshest blood that goes out uh, to the rest of the body. So if you can push the left ventricle, it can push blood to different parts of the body, and then and it's oxygen rich blood, right? So it, it, is, it is blood that the rest of the body needs. So LVAD is a mechanical device that is some that was mostly, you know, uh, used, um, you know, when patients are in hospital, but nowadays you can actually have an LVAD device and then go home. Uh, imagine some, a device that is put around the heart that can compress the left side of the heart and it assists in, in terms of, uh, you know, the mechanical function. Uh, when the tissues are not well, when the electrical function is not, uh, you know, of the heart is not going well. Reza, there's one more question that was there before I missed it. Uh, can the batteries be recharged by kinetic energy of the implantee him, himself or herself? Is that something uh, coming up uh, down the pipeline? So. Well, <laughs> rechargeable technologies are, um, you know, uh, it, it, there's a lot of innovation going on. Uh, it's not just kinetic energy, it's kind of inductive, uh, you know, uh, also, uh, but uh, kinetic energy is one way. But, you know, the technology that's available um, today you know, from quartz-based or kinetic energy, the, the amount of energy that you can actually re regenerate is very small, um, but the need for, and so when devices need very small energies, and there, uh, you know, it, it, there might be an application, um, but in the world of cardiovascular devices, I think you need a lot more energy. So there are different, um, um, it, right now innovation is going on in making packages small, but uh, storing a lot of energy. Uh, uh, the rechargeable piece is um, making um, some headway, but I see at least seven, 10 years before we can actually talk about real you know, commercial use of those devices. Very good. Uh, thank you, Reza. Thank you very much for your time. And it was uh, very uh, illuminating what you talked about, uh, you know, uh, you and I have talked about this before, but I learned a lot more today and hopefully the audience benefited also. Do you have any parting thoughts or comments, uh, Reza? Yeah, I mean, this is my passion. I like to do this. So I get very energized and engaged when I talk about this. So thank you everyone for kind of joining this call. Uh, hopefully you had a few nuggets to take away and I enjoyed talking about it. I enjoyed the questions, great questions from everyone. Thank you.